and it's just trying to to be as human as possible with everybody but also as strong as possible so that we can get together you know as a nation and as a as a whole earth universe trying our best to make sure everybody is as optimal and as healthy as possible Do you ever have so many questions and no one to ask, so they're just wasting away on Google searches you'll forget about in an hour or so? We had that same problem, and that's why we created the rd to be podcast, a resource for dietetic and nutrition students looking for answers that their peers don't have. We are students Macy and Emily and registered dietitian Carl Barnes. We engage in conversations and learn from RDs. Join us weekly as we gain insight into the unique journeys of registered dietitians all over the country. Welcome to another week of the RD to B podcast. I am your registered dietitian host, Carl Barnes. Every week we sit down with an uh, awesome registered dietitian um, to give their perspective, their feedback, and their thoughts, um, especially on the journey to becoming a, a dietitian. This is really geared towards the RD to Bs, um, but also talking about their, their experience in, in practice. Um, so this week we have another friend, colleague of mine, um, we are alumni from the un same undergrad school, not, not master's program. So Tezneem El Mizan is here with us today. Um, I'm gonna let you talk more about all of the things you do because I know you are a multi-hatted person, much, much like me, um, but super honored to have you here. Thanks so much. Yeah, thanks so much for inviting me here, Carl. It's nice to see you, nice to see everybody else. So yeah, my name is Tasneem. I also go by Taz. Um, I live in sunny San Diego, currently at the beach. So, you know, if it's safe for you to come down, you're more than welcome to. Um, I was actually born in Jersey, but raised in San Diego. Um, and I did my undergrad in nutrition uh, with Carl. And then I, uh, so I went to San Diego State University. And then I did my dietetic internship at UCSD uh, University of California, San Diego Medical Center, uh, straight out of college. And then I took a few months off um, just to kind of uh, re-energize from the internship, from undergrad, from all of that. And then um, I went, I started working at a hospital. So I, this hospital that I currently work in um, as a clinical dietitian. And then just last year, I completed my master's in integrative wellness from Point Loma Nazarene University. Um, and through that program, I also did like a health coaching uh, certification. I did the, the classes for it. And then I completed the hour sessions and took the board exam after I graduated. So I'm also currently a health coach um, with UCSD. So I've got two jobs going on and then projects within that. Awesome. Thank you so much. And like always, I'm Emily, your RD to be from University of Maryland. And I'm Macy, also RD to be from University of Maryland. I'm just going to start off by asking you, how did you first get into the field of dietetics? Um, that's a really good question. I actually didn't know I wanted to be a dietitian. I knew I wanted to do something like in the medical field. I just didn't want to be a doctor or a nurse. Um, I wanted to do something that I felt like wasn't always as available to our communities. And so um, I actually took our like catalog and just looked through all the majors and did research, very boring. It's like not thematic at all. And then I took a few classes and realized I like nutrition. And then in my nutrition class, they were like, oh, in order to go through the RD path, you have to go through these classes. And so um, that's where I realized, you know, it, it would make sense if I'm gonna go, you know, this route, I go in all the way um, to be a dietitian. And, it's amazing to see how nutrition impacts people's lives, their mental, physical, um, emotional well-being. And so I love it. <laughs> I like how you like said that you went through um, the course catalog because I remember the San Diego one when I went there and that thing's thick. So you went through a lot. Um, so yeah. going to like what we're dealing with now. So what is your experience as a clinical diet? What has been your experience as a clinical dietitian uh, throughout the pandemic? Yeah, it's, um, it's been pretty interesting. I know some dietitians, some of my colleagues uh, would like, as soon as everybody went on lockdown or working from home, we still went in the hospital um, in the beginning where we weren't really sure whether we were wearing masks or not. Um, you know, some of us were wearing masks and then the hospital was like, no. And then CDC was like, okay, everybody wear a mask. And so in the beginning, there was a lot of confusion even for the dietitians and hesitation. 
Um, and we, you know, luckily our boss was like, you guys don't need to go into the COVID rooms, just try to call them. Um, but we realized how um, more serious it was becoming for patients who had COVID. Uh, it was a lot more difficult to have our medical nutrition therapy, even though, you know, we couldn't go in and do a physical exam on them to see if they were malnourished or not. It was hard to call them because usually they have additional oxygen that they have to breathe through so they could barely talk through the phone or they might be sleeping. And then because they're in COVID rooms and contact, they were getting or they are currently getting disposables. And so the food gets colder fast and they already don't have an appetite. So they're not eating well. And if they're staying there long, it's it was it's it's been kind of hard. Thankfully, it's getting a lot better now. But in the beginning, it was hard to to feel like we can help them, but we can't help them at the same time, um, especially with like no visitors allowed. And so just trying to be very creative in ways that we can help them and be there for them. And even the families um, by calling them if the families wanted us to and just letting them know how they were doing with their nutrition or trying to figure out what foods they might like um, that aren't as temperature sensitive. So uh, it's been very interesting, very different world um, this past year with just being a dietitian and helping people out who aren't eating as well to try to help with their healing process in the hospital. Well, that's awesome that you were able to transition so well, seemingly. Um, but you also mentioned that you were a health and wellness coach. So how do your jobs as a health and wellness coach and as a clinical dietitian compare? Uh, there's definitely a lot of overlap in regards to um, like we're learning about motivational interviewing and active listening. Um, the biggest difference between the two is um, as a dietitian, like we're, you know, we're told like you're the expert and we're doing like kind of that education aspect um, and doing that medical nutrition therapy. As a health coach, it's kind of like the patient or the client is the, the driver. They, you know, we're just kind of guiding the conversation, but they're the ones coming up with their personal goals. They're the ones that are saying, okay, this is what I think I need to work on. And then we're just kind of their cheerleader alongside. There's definitely a good overlap where I've taken things as a health coach and implemented it into the hospital, especially when it comes to like diet education and kind of um, facilitating an environment where patients have that self-efficacy. So when they go home, they're able, or, you know, when I'm talking to them as a health coach, they're able to take control over their own health and come up with these goals so that they're able to have that behavior change. If that makes sense. Oh yeah, that's awesome. So as an RD, what small details do you know now that you wish you knew at the start of your first job? Um, it's a really good question. I, I'd probably say um, communication with the team is really, really important uh, in terms of like communicating with the nurses, with uh, doctors, with speech therapists. I don't think I learned a lot about that in school. And um, the part, the area that I did my internship with, there wasn't, is a different interaction from where the hospital that I work at now. And, you know, as we know, like in school and any kind of group teamwork is so important and it completely transfers over to an interdisciplinary team in the hospital where, you know, nutrition's not by itself or doctors not by themselves. It's really important to work together as a team. And I feel like it sounds like common sense, but I didn't actually realize how big it was until I actually started working and realizing, you know, the small details of even talking to the nurse and saying, oh, I noticed they're on this nutrition supplement. And then the nurse being like, oh, actually, they don't like it. And you're like, oh, I, I wouldn't have even known that they didn't say anything. Um, so small things like that by communicating is actually really a big thing. I think that's the biggest thing. Um, other than that, just taking things easy and rolling with it. It's such a fast paced environment to work in a hospital that things change day and night and just being flexible to just kind of jump in the next, you know, next thing that comes up. Okay. How can we work with it? So how did you like learn like good teamwork skills, communication skills? Cause I know you said you haven't, you didn't really learn that during your undergrad. And I guess it's more of like exposure, but how would you per like, what advice would you give like Macy and I and all the people that are listening, like to work and how to collaborate with people? Yeah, I think that that comes from being able to um, 
volunteer in other areas. Uh, I'm heavily involved in like a nonprofit community org in my community here in San Diego and on the national level, being involved in like the student organizations on campus. It's that, that kind of communication teamwork skill isn't necessarily taught through like a textbook. It's very much like experience. So just being involved in other areas outside of just like studying or school or even the internship um, allows us to kind of learn that like people skill, you're working with your own colleagues, you're working with people older than you, younger than you, different levels of expertise, and you learn planning events, um, what that's like, you know, there's people that you work well with, and then people who might be have different, may have different styles, what kind of adjustments, you know, you could both make or the team can make. And so I would definitely say it comes more from like the extracurricular than like a textbook kind of thing. Thank you. So how important do you think it is for dietitians to be like open minded and flexible, um, but also like making sure that they maintain evidence based practices? A hundred percent. I would say that they they do go hand in hand because they're because there is evidence based practice. We know like a lot of research. Um, will have like the disclaimers in it. It's not you know, one size fits all when it comes to evidence-based research. Uh, it's also, you know, because we're humans, everybody's different. Everybody goes through a different experience. And so knowing the general uh, recommendations for things, whether, you know, it's a specific type of diet or um, a specific type of recommendation, having an open mind when talking to a patient or a client, knowing that whatever recommendation we make has to have that evidence-based practice, but also cater to their style too. Uh, it wouldn't be right for me to just walk into a room without knowing anything about that person and just saying, okay, you have heart problems. This is what you need to eat without understanding them. And, and you know, if they're, if they, for example, um, don't like a specific type of food and I'm telling them you need to eat this type as opposed to taking a step back and working with them, I feel like being flexible in that sense, but also just being flexible in terms of understanding science keeps changing. We all know that and evolving. And so it's very important to be flexible and maybe, you know, what we know now and we're being taught now in 10 years is going to be different. So being adjustable to that and being able to kind of fit that in um, by understanding people around us, but also how to make that work in recommendations that we make to our clients or patients. So what resources do you use personally to stay up to date with information? That's a really good question. Uh, in our in the hospital that I work at, we have continuing education. We call them like skills rosters, where uh, it's about like every month-ish, every other month, um, somebody will come and do a, a subject about something. I remember in my internship, we had that as well, where we had like journal club. Um, definitely involved with like the A and D articles. Uh, anytime the the pamphlets come in the mail, or just like the emails come through, that'll anytime I see like an article about nutrition or something, I'll open it. Um, and then actually, the patients themselves will come up with really really random questions about nutrition that I'll kind of ponder and be like, you know, I haven't heard about that. Let me get back to you, and then I'll find myself diving into an hour or two of researching. Um, things on like PubMed or some sort of evidence-based um, research base. So when you first started as an RD, did you, uh, did you have more of those moments where you just didn't know the answers to certain questions or were you, did you feel pretty confident when you, when you first started? All the time. I still feel like I don't have the, the answers to all the questions. Um, I would say, especially more, more in the beginning because, uh, you know, in, it's impossible to learn everything. You know, we're always lifelong learners. And so I feel like when um, a beginning as a dietitian, I would definitely get a lot of questions. I was working on um, the oncology floor. So I was getting a lot of questions about like nutrition and cancer. And my answers more were, you know, let me get back to you on that. That's a really great question. I don't want to give you misinformation. And I think a lot of people appreciated that I give answers like, I don't know, but let me get back to you. And if I didn't know, or if I didn't know where to go, I would ask resources. And I'd say a lot, like now I'm a lot more comfortable with um, knowing where to go. And I may know the answers to some, but I'll, I'll say it's, it happens very frequently where they'll ask a question or I'm trying to learn something new and I just need to be up to date with it. Um, I feel a lot more confident in where to go. In the beginning, I felt very scattered, but I feel like that's how we all are. You know, with time, we get more experience. And then the more we know, the more we realize we actually don't know. 
So um, moving a little bit on. So as you probably know, dietetic students will be required to get their master's soon. Um, why did you choose the integrative wellness program at Point Loma? I, I knew I wanted to get my master's um, and I wasn't sure in what. I do remember my DPD director saying, you know, if you don't want to teach, don't get your master's in nutrition, get it somewhere else. And that kind of ingrained in my head. I love teaching, but I didn't know if I wanted to be a teacher. I actually wanted to do uh, the nutrition and exercise uh, dual master's program at SDSU. And I kind of had that in mind, but I, I knew that I wanted to take a few years off, uh, save up some money, really make sure that's what I want to get my master's in. Um, and then I, I actually moved to Boston. I got married and moved to Boston for five months. And I, that's kind of what opened my mind to look into other majors as well, because I wasn't no, I was no longer in San Diego, but then we moved back and I realized I needed extra classes to even apply to the master's program. Um, and so I was like, okay, I don't want to wait another two years to apply. Let me see what's out there. And that's kind of where I came across the integrative wellness. I attended the, um, like the, the webinar just to get to know a little bit more. And I was very interested and intrigued because during my years of experience as a dietitian, I know that even though nutrition is very important and impactful, it's actually not like the only part of our well-being. There's multiple parts of it. So I was very interested to see you know, just to be aware of what else is going on. And I, um, it's a one year, like accelerated master's program. I was working, so it, it just sounded like it was a good fit. Um, and that's kind of where I led through there. And then I, I definitely believe that um, there's a lot of lifestyle changes that could be made. And part of that is our nutrition to help us part of our, you know, overall well being. And that's very aligned with what the program had. So it was just a great fit and I enjoyed every moment of it. That's amazing. Um, so what advice do you have for dietetic students in choosing their master's programs? Uh, I would say be open-minded if you feel like you're, you know, you're not ready to decide or you're not in the right mindset to, to make a decision right away. Give it some time or maybe block off a few hours one time and just explore. Be open to attending any of their like open house webinars that they might have or um, seek other RDs. I know we have great programs here with RD to be just asking other people, maybe what other master's program they had, ask questions. You know, it may sound like a great fit to one person and it doesn't necessarily mean it has to be a great fit for you. What it's what works best for you. And so I would say explore, ask questions, research, think about what you want to do with your master's. It's a really big deal to go through a master's program. It's already a big deal to go through your undergrad and go through the DPD program. It's a lot of, of workload. And so on top of that, a master's program um, to be kind of confident in like, okay, this is what I want to get. You're spending money and you're investing a lot of your time in it. You want to make sure it's something that you enjoy. So just doing some research on it, maybe asking questions. You can look to see what kind of jobs out there that you're interested in and see sometimes jobs will say like preferred masters and dot, dot, dot. So you can see um, what that might look like and just kind of explore from there would be my advice. Thank you. So delving more a little bit into like your credentials and all that stuff. So did you always want to pursue your CNSC credential before coming in RD? I did not. I actually didn't know which one I would do. I knew I wanted to do something. I love learning. I'm still a student. At some point, I'll probably end up back in school again. Um, I just wanted to, to start, I knew I had within five years of being a dietitian, I wanted to get my master's and I wanted to have some sort of credential, but wherever that landed me. And so in the hospital, I realized I was doing a lot of nutrition support, um, and even working on the oncology floor, there was a lot more of that. So it was between doing something with oncology or the CNSC. Um, and I just felt like that would benefit me more with the CNSC, especially since I liked also working in the ICU. Um, and that's kind of where I decided to do the CNSC. So since we have a lot of um, dietetic student listeners, um, what did you do outside of class during undergrad that provided you with valuable experience? Um, any opportunity that I had to volunteer, I think I took. <laughs> Uh, I was involved in the student nutrition organization. I also was involved in our student body government. Uh, it's called Associated Students. Our um, 
Council for Health and Human Services, which was like the subgroup in our uh, in our college. And then I was also involved in our um, Muslim Student Association, sustainability. I had a few like honor societies. Started to add up, obviously, but I kind of enjoyed, you know, there's times where school was very overwhelming and I was looking forward to the org events or something. And then there's times where those were overwhelming and I was just looking forward to being in class. But I knew I just didn't want to go to school to just, you know, like learn, go into class and walk out. I wanted to be able to build networks. I wanted to be able to learn from others, be involved and kind of, you know, practice what I preach. If I'm learning certain things, how do I implement it? Um, also do some internships. I wanted to have like a good, well-rounded resume and kind of experiment areas in nutrition. I did research, um, volunteered at food banks, uh, worked with like the food service area in our school just so I can get an idea of what I like so that, you know, if I like it, great. If I don't, I know that I don't like it and I don't have to ever wonder in the future. Um, so you said you were in the student government. I personally never would have seen myself uh, taking the initiative to do student government, unfortunately, but what did you get out of that experience? Uh, the formalities of how like governance works. <laughs> the first one um, but it was nice to see kind of a collaboration through the entire university of how people from different majors were all students we're working with faculty and staff to see how we can create a better environment on our campus um, just you know going through certain uh, new laws that we want to implement whether it's through sustainability or um, something with like social justice or anything like that and so it's nice to see even within dietitians, we know that we have dietitians who are fighting for us, um, you know, with law and things like that. So it's, it was nice to see that kind of side of it. I definitely don't see myself like running for office, but it was just nice to be part of a team where learning about that. So I have much more of an appreciation for it. So as someone who is involved in a lot of extracurriculars and stuff, what advice would you give to students who are trying to do like too much? Um, and getting involved in a lot of extracurriculars? I would say take it day by day. Uh, we're all human. And I know we live in a society where they expect us to kind of, you know, go really, really, really high, but uh, you definitely don't want to set yourself up for burnout. You want to enjoy your undergrad experience. It's really like a true pre-foundation to the foundation within dietetics. And so take it a day at a time. If you're feeling overwhelmed, it's okay to step back. It's actually a really good skill to realize something is very overwhelming and say, you know, I have a lot on my plate and I want to do justice to this org or this volunteer place. And I'm not going to be able to give my hundred percent. And I'd rather give it to somebody who is, or whichever way you want to frame it, it's okay for you to step away from things. But if you feel like you're ready to explore and you want to try things, weigh out your options. We, we know that we all can't have everything, but we could be selective in where we put our energy and what kind of um, motivation that, you know, we decide to get from it. it. You know, we can't be like a mechanic and a cook and a dietitian and, and this and a principal and all of that and enjoy it. You know, we want to make sure that we're balancing correctly. And that looks different for everybody. For some people, it might just be academics and one org. For some people, it might be five, but just being, um, oh, sorry. Yeah, but just being as, you know, as flexible as possible. Um, and then being your in your own journey, not comparing yourself to other people when it's too much, knowing when to step away. And when you feel like you're up for it, then taking up that challenge. And that comes with, you know, mentorship too. Like, feel free to talk to friends about it or your mentors or your RD to be mentor, whoever it may be kind of like, I'm thinking of this, I don't know. It's also okay to enter in something and realize you don't like it and step away from it too. Thank you. So did you feel like any part of like your student journey or even I guess during your master's program that you felt that you could handle like the challenges um, that like we're facing now? So almost like, did anything prepare you for COVID almost? No, <laughs> I don't think any of us were prepared for COVID. I think it was a big shock to all of us. Um, I, I would say though, in, um, in the beginning works of my career and like being a dietitian on the oncology floor, um, you know, working really hard with patients who have cancer was very challenging for 
uh, several reasons. And the main one is, you know, you work really hard and sometimes people don't make it through. And then sometimes people do. And it's hard because, you know, we're doing everything in our effort to give them that optimal care. Um, and sometimes that happens. And sometimes it's, you know, it's a higher will of that not happening and they don't make it through. And that was really hard, especially with patients that I got really attached to who were there for a long time. And that was kind of like bringing up memories now because with COVID working really hard with these patients and the family members to help them. And it's, it's out of our control, but learning that, you know, at the end of the day, as long as I tried my best, I knew that I tried to give them the best care that I could. And I feel like that's probably the one thing that I can think of that slightly prepared me for it. But overall, I don't feel like any of us were prepared for it. Um, you know, COVID doesn't know any age or, um, you know, it just, it could hit anybody at any point. And it's just trying to, to be as human as possible with everybody, but also as strong as possible so that we can get together, you know, as a nation and as a, as a whole earth universe, trying our best to make sure everybody is as optimal and as healthy as possible. Awesome. And I think we have some students that texted in with, with some stuff regarding to COVID. So Carl. Yeah, thank, thanks, Taz. I can always cut on you for like such a great perspective on everything. <laughs> and I can't believe I didn't start out with. So Taz is one of our superstar mentors from day one when we started the rd to b mentorship program. So I, I have always appreciated you for that. Um, we had a couple uh, students text in specifically about um, to kind of condense them into one question. Like what what does the nutrition intervention look like for some of the patients that you were you were um, seeing? with COVID specifically? Yeah, that's really, really good question. Uh, usually it's, it's very, there's a lot of commonality of poor PO intake, meaning they don't really have an appetite. They already came in without an appetite. Usually they, they're in the hospital because they haven't been eating for a long time. So uh, nutrition interventions, it's kind of like, what have you liked in the past? Are you craving anything? Sometimes, you know, it's, with um, medical nutrition therapy, like, yeah, they might have heart problems. Yeah, they might have kidney problems or liver problems. Uh, but if they're not eating anything at all, it's kind of picking that priority of, okay, let's, if they're not eating anything and the only thing they, they want at that moment is a hamburger um, and they're only taking a bite or two, it's actually not gonna hurt them to take that bite uh, because it's literally the only source of nutrition. So it's kind of, you know, even though we're, we're, you know, the interventions that we usually have, we're trying to have like the most perfect plate that we can have for them. That's not always the case with the COVID patients. It's kind of seeing what do they like? What do they feel like eating that might help out? And if not, uh, the oral nutrition supplements that we have. So usually like a shake, it's got some extra calories and protein, maybe a multivitamin, um, maybe snacks in between, just figuring out with their poor PO intake. Unfortunately, there are people who have had prolonged uh, poor oral intake where they aren't eating well, their weight is continuing to decline, and we know that that impacts their overall healing process. So having that conversation of whether nutrition support is appropriate for them, if they're, you know, if that's something that they want is a tube feed and talking to the family about that. And if so, then we start initiating tube feeds until they're able to start eating again. Um, in the ICU, a lot of that's looked like having tube feeds. Uh, they start off obviously with the tube feeds and they, they have it, they're intubated for months and the only source of nutrition that they're getting is through tube feeds. Um, so that's been kind of, it's either snacks and supplements and a multivitamin or it's tube feeds. That's been the most of the interventions that we've had. That's fantastic. I love hearing that, that firsthand experience because there's a ton of dietitians on the on the front lines, if you will. Um, so hearing your experience through it and how you're how you're able to to work with patients, I got one more. If, if you're good, um, so Elliot texted in asking, um, in your experience, and I know a lot of dietitians, we all have different opinion on this one. Um, do patients care what RDs have to say? That's a really really good and funny question. Uh, and I say funny because um, you learn, I think most of the dietitians learn that our answers will always be, it depends. Um, so there are people who do appreciate it and there are people who don't. And it's literally not taking it to the heart. 
I will say that it's a very small minority of people who I feel like really don't care what I have to say. Usually they're like, oh yeah, dietitian, let's ask questions about all these diets or whatever, or the families are appreciative of it. Um, but that's okay. I mean, if they're not ready to talk to a dietitian, I've definitely had, um, there was a patient that I walked in and, and I introduced myself and I said, hi, I'm to see I'm one of the dietitians. And he goes, nope, get out. And I was like, oh, I just, you know, it's like, get out. And I was like, are you sure you don't have any questions? He's like, get out. I was like, okay, if anything comes up, just let me know. Like, you can't take it to the heart. It's really not personal. It's nothing personal. They don't want to talk to you. Um, the other day I came in to give a diet education to a patient. And I said, are you okay if we go over heart healthy diet? And she goes, diet, why would I go on a diet? Like, let's just be real. I'm not even going to listen to you. And I'm like, okay, well, you know, just respecting that boundary. Because if they're not ready for it, they're, you know, there's no reason to feel like they have to force themselves to listen to this. And, you know, if they're, I, for me, it's, I appreciate they're being honest with me. And if I have to choose between forcing somebody an education for 20 minutes and spending that extra 20 minutes somewhere where somebody might actually have questions and they're interested, then I would, you know, I obviously still want to help people, but if they don't really like talking to dietitians, I'm not going to force it at the end of the day. But I also know I can't take it personal because it's really not me. They're just, not interested and that's okay that's a brilliant take and especially if that happens to you during your internship do not take that to heart even more so because that can really really make a make an impact so i appreciate you taking the time today taz um fantastic as always uh to the students listening um text in 202-918-3818 um so that we can incorporate your questions next next week um Thank you again. It was great having you. Thanks for having me.